<laughs> Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It's the 21st of March. Happy spring. And we're gathering here with some pretty amazing folks who were at the DML conference. I think everyone was, right? Except Chris Sloan. Sorry, Chris. You should have been there. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, um and um we're here to talk about connected learning. Um want to quickly say I said Chris Sloan is here, Paul O is here, Elise Edelman Adal is here, um Lucy Manship, Mino Rami. I did practice. Um Chad Sansing is here and Clifford Lee is here and Ontario Garcia. So quite a wonderful mix of great people. Um, and we'll, we'll get into it here. Elise, can we turn to you? Did I skip anybody? Did I skip Katie McKay? Oh, I'm sorry, Katie. Katie. Yeah, I'm there here. You are. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. So we'll meet each of you and please introduce yourselves because even though we can see each other, some people listen to this on a podcast later and, um, so as you're talking, just say, hi, this is Cliff or whatever. Um, cool. Um, and Elise, could we turn to you to kick us off and give us some context for this conversation? Yeah, sure. So hi, podcast people. This is Elise. <laughs> How's that? Great. Um, yeah, so I, I think in a, people are going to be sharing lots of reflections from, uh, from a conference that we were all, uh, as you said, um, wonderfully together at recently a DML conference. But one of the things that really kicks off tonight's conversation is that this particular conference, uh, the DML community announced what we're calling the Connected Learning Principles. And um, I know in the chat room we'll be putting some links to find them. They're all at the Connected Learning dot tv um, new website which was also launched at the conference and part of what we're doing is thinking about this concept of connected learning and i think for people who've been listening to ttt for a long time there's going to be a lot of stuff that sounds familiar and sounds like the kinds of things that we've been all thinking about together for a long time but the connected learning approach or model is trying to pull those things together in a way so that they have some kind of synergy. Um, and just to give a little, just three minute context for this thing, these connected learning principles. Um, if anybody's been following the progress of the DML or digital media and learning initiative at um, funded by the MacArthur Foundation, which the National Writing Project is part of, you might know that it started with um, a really deep dive into ethnographic research about young people and their learning in a digital age. Um, and this huge study with many, many researchers involved. Mimi Ito was the leader of that research initiative and a lot of people will associate her name with it, but there was a very large team of people. And the goal of this research, this ethnographic research, was to look at young people learning, um, and especially their learning that could take advantage of uh, digital affordances of a whole range of kind. Um, and the thing that's interesting about this research, I think, is that it really focused on learning, and it didn't take categories like school or learning to learn official school content or categories like that. It didn't focus on teaching. It didn't focus on learning institutions. It just followed young people as they pursued learning. And there were a lot of really powerful observations that came out of that research. A lot of people are familiar with kind of the spectrum or trajectory that young people, of course, also adults, also anybody, the study was of young people, but anybody, could follow in their learning from kind of hanging out um, to messing around with something that captures their interests to perhaps following a trajectory to even really geek out about something. So this kind of mantra of hanging out, messing around, geeking out as a path that people follow when they're interested in something and they have a chance to connect with it and connect with mentors and tutors and really learn deeply became this foundational idea in the DML. Um, and in fact, it gets called Hamago, hanging out, messing around, geeking out, 
Hamago, which to me sounds like it should be an anime character or something like that. <laughs> um, but these were all like observations about how people learned when they had access and when they found mentors and when they could pursue their interests. What happened in DML is then all the partners and folks like us and uh, National Writing Project included wanted to say, okay, if that's a look at learning in the 21st century, how can we pull some design principles from that? What should we do as educators or as people in learning institutions or families or people who create games or media? Are there some principles for how we would design a learning environment that would allow and empower the kind of learning that we see when young people just follow their interests in a connected learning space. And that's where these connected learning principles came around. They came out of people's design efforts to create everything from uh, games to classrooms to camp to um, new library situations or new ways of leveraging um, museums, for example, to be part of a, of a learning atmosphere for kids. Um, so that all gave rise to this, and it was um, a set of principles that were created out of, out of this huge community, uh, kind of argued over for a couple of years, and then debuted on this connected learning site and as part of this connected learning set of principles. At least that's a great thing teachers again, <laughs> and we're recording. Um, who wants to respond to Elisa's introduction there? Um, at least, maybe you weren't finished. Do you want to? Do you want to summarize what you just said? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else do it then. Yeah, jump in here, folks. Well, maybe we could name. Let me just name the principles, and then Good. that would give yeah. some folks some things to maybe bat around a bit um, and uh, react to. Uh, so, I think part of. Uh, one of the things that probably we posted in the chat room and the people could look for um, would be the principles. There are connectedlearning.tv. We also pulled some of these resources together in Digital Is in a blog post dated for tonight. But just to say, um, kind of the overview of this learning approach is to say uh, there are three sets of three. There are three core values that, that we've been talking a lot about. One is equity. Uh, one is social connection and one is full participation. And these are kind of goals of trying to do design. In other words, thinking about how we design learning environments with these values as things that we want to continually reflect on and hope that we would promote equity, social connection, and full participation of everyone in the learning environment and socially as a result of learning. And with those core values, there would there are then three learning principles that learning is really most powerful when it's interest-powered, um, that following our interests and helping people cultivate interests is a really important thing to remember and focus on because interests drive so much. Uh, that learning could be peer-supported uh, in all the ways that we could think about shared expertise and communities of learners supporting each other and that it's academically oriented. And by that, I think um, for all of us, I'd be interested in what people would say, for all of us in um, more conventional schooling, I know a lot of us reacted to that with a kind of little, you know, people are gonna take that concept and they're gonna box it and they're gonna assess it and it's gonna turn into something that you don't want it to be. Um, but for folks in the out of school community, what it became a way for them to say, well, actually we really want the learning to add up for something for people that they can really translate into a more powerful position in society. So let's take academics at its best and say this really is about helping people create, attain valuable skills and knowledge within a framework of their personal values as well. So that might be one to talk about. And then there are three design principles um, when we create learning environments. One is that they're production-centered, um, that all the learners in the space, they're, they're producers. They're not just consumers. They're producers, producers of knowledge, producers of expression and text, um, builders, doers, tinkers, makers, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm.
and design learning environments where we can cultivate shared purposes and that those shared purposes help power people to attain interests and work as peers and add value. So maybe naming those, that's, that might be a way to kick off uh, people wanting to pick some threads. So lots of wonderful talkers here. Please jump in. <laughs> um, and let's let's um, focus on examples, um, you know, from your own classroom kind of thing, if that makes some sense. Minu, I don't know why you jumped up, but do you want to talk? <laughs> you laughed uh, first. Sure. <laughs> yeah, sure. So just to introduce myself, um, this is Minu Rami from Philadelphia. I'm a teacher consultant with the Philadelphia Writing Project, um, and I get to teach my students English um, at the Science Leadership Academy here in Philadelphia. Um, and I want to thank the National Writing Project for the opportunities to attend DML. It was my first time, um, and I really, it was a very uh, unique conference. I have not attended one like it. And uh, Katie, hi, Katie was my roommate, so it was a lot of, a lot of fun. Um, some of the things that jump out from uh, what Elise shared with me and in connections to some of the things that I um, have tried to do in my classroom this year, um, immediately the production-centered um, idea comes to mind. Um, I think uh, to the best of my abilities, I think I've always tried to create um, opportunities for my students to create um, evidence of their learning in the classroom rather than um, you know the traditional multiple choice or even the essay exam not that there isn't a time and a place for those things but uh, I'm lucky enough to be at a school like the Science Leadership Academy where um, project-based learning is the norm and not you know not the anomaly so um, it's it it has been a very um, interesting experience being a first year teacher at SLA and seeing the tremendous amount of experience that my students bring to uh, project based learning and it has been a very interesting year in terms of um, adapting and planning uh, my units and planning different ways to showcase my students evidence of learning. Um, I can go more into the example, but it'd be interesting to hear from others as well um, where they are in terms of these principles and this paradigm or uh, the system of thinking. And, and I'd love to hear from others as well. Well, one, one thing I've been thinking a lot about that's connected to that since um, this is Katie McKay from the Heart of Texas Writing Project in Austin, Texas. and. Um, one of the questions that we fielded during the panel, that discussion that I was a part of, was from someone who was asking, um, she brought up the point, you know, that pencil and paper are also technologies. And, you know, I think the general question was, what's the point of using these dig this digital media in the classroom? Um, when can't we do some of these same things with, more traditional tools um, on paper and one thing that we that came from that question was talking about that idea of um, connected learning and a shared purpose and an open network um, and how that's something that's only possible when we can be in spaces like the one that we're in right now um, that authentic audience and that broad audience that students can have for their work and feel like not only are they producing as opposed to just consuming, but they have an audience for what they've produced. And, um, you know, I think I thought about that in the way that I've tried to integrate technology into my classroom, but um, I really um, give them the tools that they need to not just use PowerPoint to substitute a book report, but to actually create experiences that take advantage of um, what we see, you know, what we more, maybe more techie teachers see as the opportunities that are out there uh, for technology in the classroom. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll throw in a few cents about uh, the 
kind of pure culture, uh, interest-based pieces, and, and shared pur purpose. I, I found in, in my classroom and working with students, there are students. I, I, uh, there are a lot of different axes here in, in Spectra, but there's um, there there are students who kind of hunger already for this kind of connected work, where some sense of audience or purpose outside of what is kind of schools accustomed them to is what drives them and they're hungry for it. And I think the best thing I can do for those students is kind of, you know, get out of the way is a phrase that's, that, that I use sometimes. Um, but if they know where they're going and they have a purpose and they kind of have uh, internalized the connected learning principles, uh, it's easy to keep going. I think, I think there, are, there are other students who are very much invested in a peer youth culture, but have a hard time getting to that academic piece of the connected learning. Uh, what if you are amateur experts like them? Uh, I, I work with a student who's like on his second mentor this year in a second area of media, and one's local and one's distance, um, but it's all happening because he's following his interests and he sees these people as peers and, and doing the same kinds of work he's interested in who can kind of mentor him. Um, and I've been playing too many games lately, so I'm, I'm thinking a lot about uh, how you shift kids' perspective of school as kind of this communal single-player experience. Like we all, you know, the universal aspect of school is often touted as a reason to have public education and compulsory schooling. The way that we do is that everyone has a common, you know, societal background uh, for whatever that's worth, and that certainly bears unpacking. But it doesn't come across as like a community, I think, to most students. It comes across as we're all in this place, going through our classes, our systems, our grades, whatever. It, it seems to me like a bunch of people in the same place having a single player experience. So how can schools convince kids that they have an opportunity for a multiplayer experience, a guild-like experience? Uh, community-like experience. And, and as I said, I think it comes from valuing kids' communities and kids' audiences and what kids think of as peers in their own areas of expertise a lot more than schools do. Just to tie together what you were just saying, Ted, with um, the point that Katie made, um, one of the really powerful pieces that everyone could see in, in the research, in the Homago research, was that the what the internet internet allowed was for folks to create those guilds to reach out to mentors at whatever distance around very particular initiatives, ones that could have possibly <coughs> happened in just the community of the classroom so ha that's like a significant added affordance um that that a young person can have an interest and it's maybe not uh, there's not an expert in it. It's not shared here, but through the internet, they can connect globally to a community of people around that niche, uh, and that is that is something that paper and pencil doesn't let us do. Sure. Um, oh. Yeah. And I think for for me, like I'm trying to, I try to think about it and look at it from what I what I imagine to be, and what I try to talk to my students about their view and like. They're not just trying to. They're not necessarily trying to create a, you know, PLN, a personal learning network, or to find a mentor. They're bringing someone into their life like that uh, through social media, even to mentor them. Is kind of bring bring them into you know bring them into their life. It's it's not strictly an academic exercise. So I'm interested in in schools' perceptions of what students are doing when they find a distant distance mentor, and kids' perceptions of what they're doing when they find a distance mentor. I think that that really connects also to that then idea of equity when I think about um, my bilingual students that I was teaching for several years who um, were from families of undocumented workers and they felt a real isolation in their um, in their home environment they didn't feel um, safe to create connected environments with peers um, locally because there was this fear of being turned in or being found out and um, you know, and them not having access to some of the technology and the internet at home, what um, an amazing experience for them then to be tapped into other um, immigrants in similar scenarios, but in other parts of the country, in an online space that could feel much more safe even than some of the communities that they might have reached out to locally. 
And can I ask, um, you know, what platforms do we have for this? You know, Chris Lone and I have been messing with youth voices for a long time. But at least when you say that kids can form niches, that's been central to our work. Um, but it's not easy, you know, even even in the platform that we're creating. And so I'm just wondering, it's like, can we talk about the gap between this theory and the actual yeah. platforms that teachers have available to them? A little bit. Well, actually, can I jump in? Please. Yeah. Yeah. Clifford, so this is Cliff. Yourself. And uh, one of the things that I felt like, I felt like it was kind of brought up in a number of different um, larger plenary speakers and um, even some sessions and just overall conversation. Um, it's just this technophilia idea that you kind of feel this underlying, maybe not so underlying ideology that um, in some of the larger conversations and spaces that you kind of feel this kind of the Wired magazine like uh, technology is going to solve all problems in within education and society in general. I don't know if other people felt the same way, but um, some of the discussions overall, I mean, it's they feel like that some of the tools that we utilize in the classroom can address the opportunity gaps in education without, you know, thinking about the social, economic, social, political, broader perspective when we're talking about these issues. And, um, and even just overall kind of like what um, – at least mentioned at the beginning if the focus on equity social connection and full participation we know you know as classroom teachers that that's definitely not there and by the focus of dml originally being in like out of school spaces that's problematic and i think ontario wrote about some of this in his post dml reflection um that we have to look at these public school setting and i, I think it's great that you know nwp got a lot of love at the conference and also we were well represented but it's it's a small minority compared to larger to the larger conference, and I think you know this is something that we, uh, as teachers in the public school classroom, need to continue to push. I've been uh, I'm going to jump in here. This is Fred in Watsonville, California, and one of the lenses that I use to highlight the equity issues is to pose the question, who's telling the computer what to do? Because in fact, the reality for virtually all of the public school kids that I know in our area, despite the fact that we're supposedly right here next door to Silicon Valley, most kids spend almost all the computer time that they have being drilled and killed by flashcards on computer. The only alternative to that, which is not much of an alternative, is taking accelerated reader quizzes. That's it. That's all they do. They don't even write stories on the computer anymore to speak of because there isn't the time. It's the opportunity cost. And so that this basic principle that we need to create situations where our kids are given not only the access, but the, the instruction and the skills that they need to be the ones who tell the computer what to do, who are not just writing, but programming and designing games and uh, publishing their work. All of those things are really just out of the question for most California public school kids. They have to spend their time on flashcards. Fred, this I was I was just going to bring up this sort of equity issue. Um, the last week's um, ink chat topic was, you know, like multi genre uh, projects in the English classroom, and Sam Reed, who's another TC in Philadelphia Writing Project, was on that chat and brought up a really good point, and he said. Um, all of these types of philosophies for learning and teaching, uh, for project-based learning, for giving students an opportunity to create, they tend to take place in schools that are already doing quite well and have access to technology. But what about the schools um, and, and places where there's still struggle in terms of performance? Um, instead, they're getting this very packaged curriculum, like what you said, uh, drills rather than opportunity to create authentic products for an authentic audience that Katie mentioned. Um, and I think that's a very 
very valid concern that you bring up. And it's the same thing here in Philadelphia. So, um, one of, this Hi, is Lacey, Lacey um, Manship. And... Lacey, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> sorry. Um, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and to tag onto that thinking, one of the sessions that I went to um, was about hacking public spaces, which was really interesting and awesome. It was about using sort of um, lower tech stuff like phones um, to hack into public events, places where people are already gathered to address issues of equity, social justice. And um, one of the things that came up in those sessions was talking about um, public school as a public event <laughs> where <laughs> lots of people already are <laughs> as a place that, um, you know, we need to hack into, not just, um, you know, I don't know, the St. Patrick's Day Parade, but, you know, the place where we all are every day um, in schools. Um, one thing that in our district here, you know, we're definitely one of those places where AR, Accelerated Reader, is everywhere, and um, another one, Achieve 3000, which is similar, if not worse, um, and they kind of, like, overtake all of the um, lab time for teachers, all of the computer time, um, and we've been thinking about how to use sort of, like, trailing edge technologies with teachers um, to and kids to try to create more access to um, to other people. So, you know, teachers using their phones um, in, with their kids or kids using their phones, using um, flip video cameras, things that, um, you know, don't tie us to the stuff that seems to be taken over by um, some of the corporate pieces. And, you know, I it just, this is great, a great conversation, and I think really an, an important, um, an important uh, set of reminders in relationship to these design principles that, you know, that we have a long way to go before we can really um, enact. One of the things that's been really interesting to me is, as I've had an opportunity to work with some of the folks who are trying to create connected learning spaces outside of schools, like the U Media Center in, um, in Chicago, a kind of network of building those out, is that actually it, it's not all that much easier in some of the out-of-school places. <laughs> so there are these test beds um, where you can see kind of amazing things going on, but if you think about um, you know, the mass number of libraries or the mass number of museums, other learning institutions in addition to schools, there's a whole need to reinvent what those institutions are about as well. Um, a lot of folks, for example, there's a network of people thinking about museums. And if you take something like the Fine Arts Museum and you say, what would it take to be production centered, not consumption centered? This is an institution that has, please don't touch everywhere you go. You go into a gallery, there's often nowhere to even sit down because you're not supposed to hang out. You're not supposed to spend time there. You're supposed to go admire something and then go to the gift store and buy something and maybe the cafe and get some coffee. For a fine arts museum to reinvent itself as a place where a wide range of people with equity and social justice in mind can come together to learn and create in addition to consume is also pretty huge. So I, I would just say for myself, you know, seeing some of these amazing out of school examples that we might have seen at, at from our DML partners um, for a while, they were kind of so bright to look at that I couldn't see beyond that to see actually how hard it is for any learning institution to reinvent itself around these principles. And I think, I think the out of school opportunities are, um, I think they're easier for us to look at. I, I, I totally agree that there's all these challenges around them, um, but I appreciate looking at like you media um, in particular because it actually reflects the public, right? Like to push back on kind of what Lacey was saying, I think there's a real problem in saying that what public schools look like reflects the public itself because I think I think the public experience of the school that I teach in is completely divorced from the reality that happens outside of the walls of the school with the, the big fence around it every day. And the way our policies and the way we treat technophilia, as, as Cliff was talking about, um, 
really tries to look to these antidotes that are going to fix the problem of in schools that look completely unlike what happens outside of schools. And I know um, Katie made this really clear in her presentation at DML, and I thought it was really helpful to hear about the way her computer lab isn't being used in Texas um, and kind of the, the issues of equity that, that are there also. And I think to really open up that public space in schools, which I think is what we should aspire to, the possibilities of a public experience in public schools, um, really takes bringing more people into this space, right? We need um, more people of color sharing in these experiences. We need parents. I think that was that still continues to be the huge question mark in the DML space. There aren't any parents, I think, in these space. Well, I mean, I think by default, oh, there are many parents there. Um, but I think speaking as parents, um, that is a demographic that tends to be absent um, in these types of conversations, as well as students. There, there were um, some students there, and I, I felt very inspired hearing from them. Um, but when it comes to leading and driving these types of conversations, they tend to be absent as well. Sorry, this is Ontario, by the way. I realized I didn't introduce myself for the, the non-visual people. Um, if I could talk about your academic side of things there in that chart. Um, you know, Chris Sloan, my experience sorry. is a lot. Oh, I'm Chris Sloan. I teach in Utah. And, uh, you know, my experience in my classroom is a lot different than what you're describing. Um, like, these kids are really, um, you know, pretty sharp kids and they're pretty connected. And um, we've got all the tools that we need because, you know, I've been there for long enough that people just let me do whatever because whatever <laughs> seems to work really well. And, um, you know, we had some visitors the other day, some foreign journalists through a State Department visit, and, and they were really interested in how my kids got information about elections. And, you know, so they were talking about all the apps on their phones that they have that keep them informed and, you know, how somebody came across this uh, little context in Utah, which is a very conservative state, you, you might know. Uh, they passed a bill that wanted to restrict uh, sex ed from um, being taught in schools. So, you know, like my students were up in arms about that. And so somebody talked about how they um, got something, you know, a tweet about it through a Utah news organization. And then they got right online to their Facebook uh, um, petition campaign. And, you know, it was examples like that that the the foreign journalists were really interested in. But what I want to get to is a different side of when things are going well. There was this uh, AP article last week that we talked about in my class. And, and the point was that young people today aren't as um, uh, in civic minded oh. as we think they are. You know, because sometimes I think we tend to like stories like I just told we think that's the norm or whatever, or people think that because everybody's so connected, kids, that they're really, um, you know, like civic minded. And so I, I, I'll put this article in the chat room because I was really surprised by it. So I wanted to throw it by my students and say like, you know, what's the deal? This article says you're not as green as we think you are and you're not as civic minded as we think you are. And they, without batting an eye, they said, yeah, that's, that's actually accurate that we're being overestimated as how civic minded we are. And these kids are actually pretty civic minded. So I think that like, there's the other side of the coin where like, how do we deal with kids who are so inundated with information that they're almost like shutting down is, is something that I deal with. I told the story in, in class today. I was doing a substitute job in a fifth grade, fifth, sixth grade combo, and I told the story about uh, somebody being taken to heaven and hell, and there's a round table where everybody has chopsticks that are too long to reach your mouth, and the people in hell are all fighting and complaining, but the people in heaven are all happy. What's the difference? Well, the difference is the people in heaven are feeding each other. You just reach across the table to someone else. And I think what uh, what Elise was saying about collaboration with other institutions is an example of that kind of feeding each other. I, I often think of my work as looking for the cracks in the system and what is the exact 
shape and size of wedge that's needed for each particular crack. Um, so there are programs like the migrant program where exactly this kind of connected learning that we're talking about happens where families are involved, kids are involved, the school is involved. There's usually a community center of some kind that's involved because things are happening after school, if not at the school, at some community center. And all of this is being done for the most part without technology. This is one of the collaborations that we're looking to foster is with our, our local migrant program. Yeah, I, another I, example of. Go ahead, Mina. Go ahead. Um, another example of that type of collaboration between these institutions, like the museums, might be the partnership, like the one that Science Leadership Academy has with the Franklin Institute. So there is mm. an established partnership between this science museum and this high school that's focused on science and math curriculum but you know it's not just science and math like it's a you know college preparatory project based high school in Philadelphia but the advantages of being in a school like that are just so obvious our freshmen get to spend Wednesday afternoons uh, at the museum taking classes on on things like scratch and they're learning all kinds of things that they wouldn't have otherwise had a chance possibly to learn because of this robust and ongoing partnership that we have with the museum. They have resources that a small high school like ours um, would not have. So um, to go back to Elisa's point, I think one way to address, um, you know, how do we, how do we sort of change that culture of those institutions? One possible ways would be to form these types of partnerships um, between schools and museums and colleges in in our urban cities and i would add gardens and community organizations and you know things out there in the street too <laughs> that's right absolutely yeah. 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 um actually to throw in another thing that might be controversial i think if in that picture um that's also where the dml interest in badges fits um, because one of the which which I know people are much divided around but in a way one of the things that, um, that this kind of opens up if you think of uh, school and other institutions and family as just one node on the learning network that young people might have yeah how do we um, how do we have a way that we kind of break this batch processing that school gives us like I have to find, I have to have my whole uh, seventh grade class all as a group go over to the museum or visit the garden or participate in whatever as a batch. Um, it's field trip day. We're all going to go over. We go through the docents, you know, planned thing. That's sort of not really interest driven um, or allowing for multiple pathways for young people to follow kind of diverse learning trajectories. So part of the interest of the badge system is to imagine, is there a way to think about young people at, or any learner and their assessment in a way that's not just batch processing um, on the same timeline, moving through as groups, but in a way that allows for diversity of pathways. So just to throw in another thing. Well, that people I, I remember, have. you know, it, it, the, I, I, was very struck at some point reading uh, the the uh, the proposal that what's pro the the problem with standards is not the standards but that they're tied to age and if we so in a way if you if you took the idea of badges and apply it to the entire curriculum so we have a common core curriculum there it is and at any point we could have a third grader say, you know, I think I've mastered all of this up to, and I'm going to show you by, and then they have a, they do a, a demonstration, and they're, they've passed the 12th grade CCSS, and therefore, for the rest of their schooling, they get to direct their learning. <laughs> they don't have to worry about 
meeting any of the other expectations. They've done that. All learning could be that if we just decouple it from age. The devil's in the details and how many details. Like if you give me <laughs> 5,000 things that a third grader has to know, I think we're in trouble. I, I'm exaggerating, but I, I think that's part oh, really? of the question. Um, I, Wait, can can um, I ask us? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I was thinking, um, well, Elise was talking about um, the the ways that badges might, you know, open ways, um, paths to um, assessing interest. And I was, what, I, what I think about, you know, the first time I was seeing that cool connected learning map and seeing some of the videos, I was thinking, you know, this is what my kindergarten class looks like. This is what my first grade class looks like. The majority of the day, children spend in center time. They're making their own choices about what to do. They're talking to each other. They're making like all day long, they're making and they're sharing this stuff, they're collaborating, they're bringing their parents in, sharing with other grade levels. And I've, like many early childhood teachers have always done, have documented all of that work that they do through, um, you know, through anecdotal net records, also through, you know, videoing them, through recording the things that they're talking about, through their own reflections. And um, all of those things are like really, to me, um, they're really valuable parts of the learning process um, and also assessment um, pieces that can show where students are. Um, so I don't know, it's so weird to me that that could also be coupled with um, or could somehow look the same as a sort of extrinsic mark upon a kind of learning um, and yet they kind of sound the same. <laughs> but, but can I jump in about the time frame thing for Mipple? Go for it. Um, yeah. I, you know, one of the things that is so great about the, the technology and the vision put forth in connected learning is that when students are ready, you can really kind of um, very quickly go out and find support so that they might need to do interest and in, in maker oriented, production oriented tasks. Um, but just because the technology is fast, doesn't mean that you know the process, human processing and approaching that choice is going to speed up, and it really doesn't mean that schools are going to speed up, right? I mean, throw a million iPads into a school, and you're going to have Zeno's paradox that school will only ever approach so far to what it is you want them to be doing with all those iPads or whatever piece of technology it is. So you know what I really want to find, and what I continue to look for, is um, as Fred was saying, disruptive things that alter the time frame within compulsory education. Uh, that That is a huge, huge, huge disruption. And there has to be that kind of flexibility and choice early on and throughout. It's really not something I think we can let go of in middle school or high school. Because I think as students get older, even when you offer them choice, it takes a long time for them to trust that choice or take advantage of that choice. Because in many ways, some of which are developmentally appropriate as kids grow, I think nearly every student's story is a story of how much resistance to the choice the adults want me to make is permissible in my life. And it could be the student who skates through school, gets away with texting between classes, could be the student who says, you know, enough with all of this. But sometimes I look at it that way. You know, compulsory schooling, as it goes on and on, the student's narrative becomes about, you know, how much can I resist? what the adults want me to do. And if that's the only choice you're kind of allowed, or if that's the operant choice in the adults' minds and making kids do things, all these other choices, if adults present them, uh, aren't going to happen right away. So uh, culture of trust and choice and opportunity and equity kind of permeates and settles and bubbles and um, works and happens for a while. So I think there are places where this could happen right away. I think there are other places where it doesn't, it, it is a matter of access and equity to the digital pieces, but also access and equity to like self-determination. Yeah, another another term that is so important is agency. Yep. That developing a a sense of agency in in the child as a person who 
That, that's what self-directed learning is based on. Yeah, I want to name some things really specifically that are not um, suggested by the connected learning principles too, because these were subjects of um, great debate over the several years of what seems like a pretty simple draft, but it, as you've all been part of collaborative processes, there's no draft that's simple when it's a collaborative process. But um, there's not a belief that that technology is a magic bullet. So the key principles talk about, um, even in choices like openly networked things, there are networks of people that may not be technology enabled. So it's really not a set of principles about online learning or blended learning or tech integration. Those things are um, tools that provide some greater affordances to a learning environment and are important to think about, but it's not an argument that tech is a silver bullet. And it's also not an argument that any of this is easy. So I'm, I'm really kind of moved by some of uh, what Chad and Fred were talking about in terms of the human condition <laughs> in effect. Um, you know, like people say, the human condition is to reinvent the wheel in some ways that you, you can't avoid that in life. It's the connected learning principles are design principles that don't suggest necessarily that it's easy to support people in finding and exploring an interest um, or that it's easy to support production or that people won't actually resist some steps that you invite them to take in a learning environment. None of these things are thought to be easy. They're just thought to be design principles um, that one might want to pursue and use to reflect on a learning environment. There's still the, the craft, there's still the, there's still actually design and reflection and growth and critical thinking that anybody who's oriented pedagogically is going to have to do, whether you're a teacher or you're someone else. And so really they were kind of created to give a framework for some things we might want to talk about together um, over time. Uh -oh. Other thoughts? I, what I wanted to ask for were a couple of more examples, um, real things that people are doing where there is connected learning happening. And I wanted to offer a quick one myself, um, and that is <laughs> to, to say that a student wanted to do a project where she was writing about nail polish. And I'm like, what? Nail polish? Can I really let this happen? Um, and I did. And she wrote about the psychology of color. And she got into some of the chemicals that are involved in it. So she did all that. And so she's making connections to lots of different kinds of information that I was surprised by. But then, um, interestingly, a, a student at another school in the Bronx, Green Dot, um, was on Youth Voices and she found somebody who was talking about nail polish and how she stopped um, biting her nails. And it was all about her relationship with her mother. And I showed that to my student and all three girls, the, the uh, other one was, I'm not telling this clearly, but the, the, the school in Queens girl who, who talked about how she started using nail polish when she wanted to stop biting her nails and it was a whole relationship with her mother the girl at the green dot school had a similar experience and then my student said oh you know what that's why i started using nail polish too so i know that's not connecting institutions but when i hear about connected learning that's what i look for i look for connecting the information and then connecting students and going deeper in what might seem like a silly topic, but it goes deeper because of the connections. So that's one example that I'll offer. Anybody want to jump in with another example here at the end? <laughs> sure. 
Uh, um, Great. Yeah, Paul, you're making me think about um, some a couple things that have happened actually in my um, first year writing class that I'm also teaching right now. Mm -hmm. um, and this has happened through the National Writing Project um, through some for some. Um, I sent out some requests to some TCs for video snippets for a little video I was making for our site and um, ended up like really getting this awesome connection with um, a few other t TCs just in the use of um, Google um, file sharing. <laughs> like it was making it so easy and um, a middle school teacher started just like sending me these cool videos of some things that were happening in this class like in the moment. And um, I'm kind of like on Skype saying like, oh my gosh, this is really cool what's happening in this open mic that happened today. And then um, I'm like heading off to teach my first year writing class. And um, this video happened to be of this student talking about how he was going. Oh no. Uh, and kind of like this process, how he went between the pieces on the same day that I was actually um, asking my first year writing students to um, start making some doing some blogging stuff so I showed them this video of this middle schooler talking about his process and um, it was it was really cool it was really connected our classrooms you know across um, uh, across space and time and ages um, mm -hmm. so yeah cool another thing we did recently at my school was um, our team decided to write how to's which I kind of was bored at the idea when I first thought about it, um, but we we decided to videotape them, and they we used a lot of how tos that were online as examples. You know that's become such a um, you know huge trend now that you can just look up how to do anything online, and they've you know they've done that before at home. So they it was this new excitement over a genre that I think had um, just a whole new level to it when they had these these other examples online that they could look at and some of them were saying well they just had to film it at home because their guinea pig was at home and they couldn't do it any other way if they didn't have the real thing there and um, we ended up then mm -hmm. presenting those to other classrooms um, we haven't been able to get them online yet which is what we do hope to do eventually but um, they, they chose a specific audience they said well I don't need my parents to see a how-to about how to be safe at the school because that's not, you know, the audience, they already know that, but I need to go over to the first grade room, and that is something important for them to know. And so then being able to choose that really specific audience and take that video um, or that live performance, a few of them chose to do it in a live performance, but um, I think that added technology and the mentor text that we found online on YouTube and other sites really gave it this whole new dimension to kind of an, an older a genre that, that's been taught many times in many classrooms. Hmm. Cool. Anybody else <laughs> want to tell a story? Well, one of the interesting things that are happening in my classroom right now is oh. actually not with my 11th or 12th graders, but my advisory, my ninth graders. Hmm. So at SLA, uh, as an advisor, you see your ninth graders uh, go through their four-year experience um, as a group and with you as their advisor. So you really, you know, you really are like the school parent for them. And so it's a very unique relationship. And I've been and and we've been together since September. And I've been trying all kinds of things with them because I I just I just love them and it's just really been fun uh, to spend time with them. And I get to see them two times a week for you know, 45 minutes, 50 minutes. And one of the things that we're doing in the third quarter that's been interesting is um, I'm, we're calling them passion projects. So I asked I ask them to share something that they're passionate about. And it can be anything. It can be like gardening or ballet or ping pong or like whatever, something that they spend enormous amount of uh, gaming, like uh, to, to give a little shout out to Minecraft and Chad's philosophy of, of game-based learning. Um, and it's just been so interesting to see them as learners and bring in examples and guest speakers and props and uh, like every Monday and Thursday, like I look forward to like, what am I gonna learn about? And it's just such, it's been such an interesting way 
to learn about my my kids um, and and for them to learn about each other and we've made some connections um, that we would have not made otherwise um, and that's been a lot of fun uh, and I'm hoping to share some examples uh, possibly with a, a digital is post because I think it'd be interesting to uh, sort of look at um, what learning looks like when it's not mandated by me or other teachers or uh, the traditional school that Chad talked a lot about. I, uh, I, have, a, I have a story, a connected learning story that actually started at, at DML because um, I left San Francisco kind of fascinated by like driving past Zigna to, uh, to the hotel and then going out and finding restaurants and stuff and just trying to take in the magnitude of the, the homelessness problem but also looking at the beautiful art on the street, looking at the art at MoMA, and just a, a lot of public, private, wealthy, not wealthy space so thinking going on in my head. So I brought back just some information and a bunch of pictures I took to my students and asked them, you know, just said, if you wanted to do anything with this, I, I was, I'm really interested in this week. I'd love to see what you do. Um, and so there's a, there's a group of students in the morning who are on a Minecraft server now building um, the downtown mall in Charlottesville, Virginia from blueprints, uh, different things they found online, uh, photo references, uh, but also researching um, what our local um, homeless population is like and where do they go, what services are available, and putting up signs. So they're kind of making a, an exhibit, including the, the free speech wall, which is a, a downtown fixture where they'll put kind of most of their information with signs. And I hope uh, can't do it from, <laughs> I, can't, I can't port out the server from school. But I'm hoping at some point to go to another place with wireless and to port it out and it, maybe to invite them on and invite on um, other people from the DML community and the Minecraft community right. to check Chad, out what they've done. Chad, you can't hack your own school? What's that? <laughs> you know, I, uh, yeah, no, I can't, I can't um, open ports on our network to outside traffic from my classroom, apparently. I, who knew, right? I just assumed it would be no problem. You know what? One thing to throw in that I love that example too. But I, just to, for anybody who might be listening from um, from a sort of not so tech example, I was triggered by passion based projects, and just thinking that the the old standby of the iSearch project, which mm. goes way 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 back in um, in writing pedagogy and national writing project, to me it's a great example of connected learning. It's um, you know, you, you're finding your own question and you're following the learning wherever it takes you. And it's not even, it, it, the journey is a very powerful one. Um, go interview, get outside the school, go study, put it together and come up with an iSearch project. And I think that fits the model too. Absolutely. Um, Elise and everybody here, we've lost a few people along the way here, but we should finish. I wanted to ask, at least if you could answer a question about how is the writing project sort of, or the writing projects you know, kind of uniquely ready for these design principles? Is that a fair question or <laughs> yeah, how does it yeah, fit together? I, so. yeah. I, I guess um, for me, I think that the, that in a lot of ways, the model of learning for adults in a writing project feels really symmetrical with connected learning. So I think in a lot of ways we um, experience in writing projects uh, a model of peer supported learning of, um, you know, not hierarchical interchanges, expertise that can come from anybody in the room that can be collaborative. Um, and we, we kind of design learning experiences for adults with a lot of these principles, not that we couldn't leverage more or make them better. So I, I guess I think what's, um, that in some ways having experienced this sort of thing as a learner makes it helpful and more possible to imagine how you could create a learning space yourself because you've lived it in addition to, in addition to read about it let's say. It comes from a base, a depth of your own learning. So that's what I would say about um, writing projects and the connected learning principles. And the second thing I'd say, going back to um, some of the comments that like Cliff and, um, and Taro made about uh, sort of the entry, and, and other people here, the entry of schools into DML. It is true that a lot of the theory and practice 
And test bed examples like U Media or Hives, those were all developed in out of school spaces. But those folks have come to a realization that actually it would be silly to forget that for six hours a day, the young people they care about are likely to be in these other things, these schools, these buildings. So I think they're this year at DML with um, some of the keynotes and plenary sessions, there was kind of an announcement of needing to put school back in um, the mix of conversation. And in some ways, I think the writing project teachers and writing projects are people who can walk across those boundaries um, and maybe be helpful in leading the way to thinking more broadly. We should finish, but did anybody say, did anyone jump in with an answer to that um, question too? Or We should finish, ahead, but it's... Hmm? Oh, we lost Yeah, I was sound. just going to um, echo what Elise said, because um, when I hear a lot of, when I hear a lot of uh, media literacy programs talked about, it's almost like um, they can't be taught in schools. This is kind of almost uh, an assumption that a lot of people make. And, you know, I know schools' curriculums are crowded and everything, but I always take exception to that, um, that really schools are, you know, really good places for media literacy programs. But really, when I hear the success stories of places like DML, it seems like, you know, that's the only way that those can happen. Well, we need to keep telling stories about this um, happening. Uh, I'm not prepared. Um, I wanted to... Uh, t so can somebody talk about what's happening at PDPU? And um, also, there there are webcasts happening on Thursdays. Is that right? You, can at least can you fill us in on the details of some of that, or where to go to find out about it? Yeah, we. I think okay. if folks go to uh, digital is to digital is dot nwp dot org, uh, in the most recent community blog post that you'll see right on the front page. Uh, will be kind of all the information you need. And the big picture about the webinars is that on this new Connected Learning community website, connectedlearning.tv, there is a series of weekly webinars with um, researchers and some of the folks who have created some of these things like UMedia or Quest to Learn. They'll all be recorded. They're during the day, so they're going to be hard for teachers. Um, <laughs> they'll be in class, probably. Uh, but they'll all be recorded and they're in the archive and an interesting set of things to go read and, and dip into. So I'm pretty excited about how many teachers are doing all this work. Um, it's It seems like the team is growing and growing all the time. So it's pretty exciting. I have my Marshall uh, cup, by the way. <laughs> I was thinking how much bigger the team is now, by the way. Anyway, I'm <laughs> inside the um, rock. <laughs> anyway, so um, we want to go out by saying that we've been broadcasting here over the EdTech Talk network of the World Bridges, I got that wrong, and channel of the World Bridges Network. Thanks to Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier and everybody else who's been supporting all this. Thank you all, and this is an ongoing conversation. Good night. Thank you, Paul. Good night. Thank you. Good night.